industry. Okay, this one is something that uh, affects us all, and that's blood testing, blood mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all go in sooner or later to have blood tests done, and you got to wonder if uh, – uh, the results that come back are accurate. Are they are, are they uh, false positives, false negatives? If we go in, and uh, this company, uh, uh, this comes from uh, Abbott Laboratories and Dynaboat, their Japanese affiliate. Uh, so uh, this came, uh, and and now you can see here they're interested. Uh, their experts say, well, they've got a response. It's called a signal, uh, and this is a a signal that they're targeting for 1,620, okay? They have a machine in this blood test that uh, records the target uh, or the value of the signal. Their target is 1,620, and their uh, specs, they have specs. Now, what are the specs? The 1,570 to the 1,670. On this normal distribution at the bottom of the page, you will see the specs. Whoops, I don't want that one. I want this one right here. The specs are right here, Mike, where the red starts on the left and where the red starts on the right. Yeah. Those yeah. are the specs at 1570 and 1670. So you can see that you got a lot of red. You got a lot of out of spec, possible false positives, false negatives coming out of this test. That would not hack it, okay? Yeah, that's not good. Your DPM, your defects per million is 571,000. Basically, half the tests they're running are out of specification. Yeah. You got 57% defect rate, and you can look yeah. at the other stats there, but that's the one I concentrate on, is 57% of the area under the curve is red. That is not good. They're not going to sell anything, if uh, any of their blood tests, if this is, uh, you know, drug testing, they may be buying for uh, the Major League Baseball contract. You think they'll be able to compete? For, forget it. They may not be able to complete on this drug testing, uh, you know, uh, uh, contract. So they get down into the business of saying, okay, what are our factors? Now, if you're a subject matter expert, that's where we need you. We need you to understand what are the factors that could impact that signal. Well, they came up with seven. Substrate type, pH, reagent concentration, you can see them there on the left. Mm -hmm. Those are the factors. They wanted to do a screening design. Now, when you do seven factors, unlike the three we did in the sales example, or the director of sales did, uh, you know, two to the three is eight, eight, possible combinations. If you did that for seven, two to the seventh would be 128 possible combinations. Way too expensive. Yeah, Takes yeah. too long. So what we're going to do, uh, a general rule of thumb is, is that if you have six or more factors, you probably want to screen first before you model. Mm -hmm. So screening is the first thing we'll do here. And we can do that with a very simple 12 run design, which is called an L12 design. It happens to be a Taguchi 12 run design, uh, but uh, it doesn't matter. Let's see where's our 12 run screening design. I'm going to, uh, uh, Mike, uh, eliminate putting in the data. I'm going to tell you the data that they already have. Okay. Here is the 12 run design, which is an excellent design for testing up to 11. You have the ability to test up to 11 factors mm -hmm. in a 12 run design. There are really 11 columns, but we only have, we're only showing seven because they only wanted to test seven factors. Okay. So okay. they're doing 12 test cases. Each of those 12 test cases looks like this. So if you tick test case two, you're using substrate type one with a four and a half pH, reagent concentration at 2%, mixing time is one minute, uh, incubation time is also one, the incubation temperature is 120 degrees, and the blood temperature is 100. So that is the combination, and now they did four replications. That is the number of reps, Mike, to have a significant, that is a 95% confidence level in your result. Mm -hmm. uh, so the number of replications, we had 16 before, uh, because the, the director of sales had, he had the number of sales reps available to do it. Well, in this test, you gotta be efficient, uh, but you still have to be effective, and so the number of replications is going to depend on the number of test cases. So we have 12 test cases and we have rules. Uh, software will come up with this automatically and say, you should be doing four replications. So that's what they did here to have 95% confidence in their results for both Y and for S for standard deviation. So this is called a 12 run screening design. And its purpose in life is to screen out the main effects. In screening, you are not interested in interactions. Interactions come from modeling designs. Mm -hmm. This is a screening design. So a very simple, and you mentioned it in the last example, a very simple analysis technique, Mike, is the marginal means plot. You can get that from the raw data. 
Let's get it from both Y hat and S hat for the factors that affect standard deviation and the factors that affect the mean. Now, this is a marginal means plot where all of the marginal means are on the same graph right now, Mike. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, do you have to be a mathematical wizard to figure out where the longest lines are? You don't have to. You don't have to be a math genius to figure out which one's different from the rest. Exactly right. It's number one. It's way over here. It's this guy here. And you know what that happens to be? A qualitative variable called substrate. Mm -hmm. Substrate type. These are two different substrates. They're coming from two different vendors. So which is the better vendor? Which is the better substrate? Mm -hmm. It's this guy because in standard deviation, smaller is always better. Smaller is better. So smaller dots are better. Mm -hmm. The stuff here, this guy's going to, when we, when we get the, uh, when we get the, the regression results, this guy's going to have a significant p-value, but relatively speaking, it's not nearly as important as the, uh, the first factor there, which is substrate type. The other guys, they're just probably just noise in there. Uh, you know, there's, there's no substance there at all. Now, when you look at the y, that's for s. Now, that's, that's gold. When you discover a factor that shifts your standard deviation, Mike, that's like finding gold. Yeah, so that may be that may explain all of the variability of your process right there. Exactly right. Okay. And right. turns out that it will, but we'll get validation of that in the modeling design, okay? okay. Uh, so here's your why. Now, this one is not so clear cut. Mm -hmm. You but again, you still don't have to be a mathematical wizard or a rocket scientist to figure what your top 3 are. That's number 1 there. And that's your, uh, that's the third guy. That's reagent concentration. Number two is your pH. And number three hitter, as far as uh, length of line segments, is your incubation time. Okay. So those three factors are the guys that will affect the center uh, or the mean of your output distribution. And uh, the other guys, the S's here, will, uh, that guy's a big hitter. You've got to control that guy at the setting where you get the smallest standard deviation. That's, that's the bottom line. Now, we can also do, from the design sheet, we can get the regression analysis, and uh, uh, we just go in and do the analysis, not the marginal means this time, but get the regression, and you're going to start seeing red and non-red here. And uh, you can see over here for the S, the two guys that are red are substrate type and incubation temp. Those were the two longest lines on the S marginal means plot. You can see, relatively speaking, 31 is a lot bigger than 8. But they are both statistically significant, so we got to keep that in mind as well. Not only relatively speaking, but statistically speaking. Over here, this guy's not important, but the three big hitters are pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time. So the screening allows us to understand what are the most important factors. Notice the screening design does not give us information on interactions. To get information on interactions, we have to use a modeling design. And that's what we did next, Mike. We went in, picked those top three factors out, and we did a design. Now, this should look familiar to the, to the listener. Uh, that's an eight-run design, just like we did with the, uh, uh, with the good old sales data. Yep. The sales yep. data was an eight-run full factorial for three factors at two levels, and that's what, exactly what we have here. Three factors, each at two levels. Two times two times two, yep. eight possible combinations. The number of reps here was five. Remember in the sales, he had, he had enough reps to do 16 reps. We're only going to do five reps, but five reps is enough here. Replications is enough to, to give us uh, the ability to get at least 95% confidence in our resulting models. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the design. We can now do the, uh, the um, analysis on this guy. We can do the uh, analyze the design, and now from the design, the modeling design, we get uh, this guy right here. Now, what do we know? And, and why we were doing this design, the substrate type and the incubation temperature were held constant at their, their pre prescribed or their best settings. Mm -hmm. So when we were doing this experiment, the two guys that we found significant in the S-hat model, primarily substrate, had to be held constant during this experiment. Now, what do we know now? that we didn't know before. Well, we knew before that pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time were important. They're still important. The modeling design tells you they're important. So this design actually validates what we saw in the screening design for the main effects, and it also discovers one other interaction effect, the interaction effect between A and B, which is pH and reagent concentration. That's a very strong interaction. These other three guys, this is also knowledge. 
They are not important. The ACC and the ABC, the three-way interaction, are not important. So we found information about the interaction effects. Notice how your R-squared bumped up now. We've yeah. got not yeah. over 99%. Gosh, I'll take that any day of the week. <laughs> we can get 99% uh, R-squared. Uh, so over here, uh, nothing is significant. We can go to the marginal means to see that, relatively speaking. So if we go up here and get the marginal means of the Pareto uh, or the Pareto effect. We can get the Pareto of both Y hat and S hat. And uh, you don't see anything significant for the S hat, but for Y, you're going to see not only the reagent concentration, pH, and incubation time in the same order, relative order as they were from the screening design, mm -hmm. but now you've got this initial uh, additional information on the AB interaction, and the other guys are just insignificant. Okay? So basically, we've got that. So we've got a good regression model. But we've got to take the garbage out of here. So when we optimize, we're going to optimize. We've got to find the settings for pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time that will get us to our target. So we're going to take garbage out. That is the insignificant terms over there. Nothing's important over here. So we're going to take these guys out as well. Uh, they don't uh, tell us too much. Uh, and uh, there's no significance there. And we're going to regress again. I'm just going to go in here and get the uh, parsimonious model. There it is. And now it's going to be on this model that we're going to optimize. We're going to use this model to find the critical settings that we need to hit a target of 1620. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to do that, we go to graphs and optimization. We'll use the optimizer here. And we don't have multiple responses. We only have one. Now, the software is now asking me to specify the low and high settings of each of the factors on which we want to allow the software to search for the optimal solution. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not going to go outside the range that we did when we did the DOE, which this is the low and the highs of the DOE that we did. And going outside would be what we call extrapolation, which can be a bit hazardous if you extrapolate too far. So we're just going to leave the lows and highs here and allow the software to search in that three space, where is the best combination? Can we hit 1620? We say, okay, and we're going to just do a very simple optimization here of, say, get my Y to 1620 and add that constraint, and now we optimize, and here are your results right down here. The results say, you want to hit 1620, put your pH at 7.4, your agent concentration at 5, and your incubation time at 4.96. We will copy these settings to the worksheet, and they, the software just copied them into our predictor, and now our prediction under these settings, these experimental settings, our prediction is a target of 1620. We should hit 1619.96, which rounded to 1620. Your standard deviation will be that. And here's your 99% confidence or risk bounds. So 99% of the time, your, uh, your results should go between 1514 and 1725, hitting a target there. So we know with three factors, pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time, we know we can put our response variable right on the target. And here are the combination of the settings that will do that. Notice that they're all three of them are up towards the high end of the space or the range in which pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time were tested. Uh, it's up there close to seven and a half for pH, close to five, exactly five for reagent concentration, close to five for incubation time. Uh, so uh, that's what it is, okay? That will produce, let me show you if we went in and uh, told you what it will be from a prediction point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, the graph, I have that already, already in uh, this scenario right here. This is what your new scenario would be at the bottom. After the DOE, at those optimal settings, Mike, you will get uh, the CPK or a prediction of, now, it's still not the greatest. Yeah, it, you know, I, I would have thought uh, based on the DOE and this analysis that we did that, you know, it would have six standard deviations in there. It'd be a six sigma process where you only have a few defects per million opportunities, but it's still showing 154,000 defects per million tests run. That's right. You're down to a 15% defect rate. Up here, it was 57%. Down here, the proportion that is red is 15%. Still not good enough. One DOE that is concentrating on three factors with, with one factor, mainly the uh, substrate type being the variance reduction factor. But the bottom 
t the bottom uh, graph, Mike, shows you that we are right on target. The process is centered between the specs where it's yep. not up above. Now, right. what's, our, what's our objective now? We've got to remove more standard deviation. Right. We've right. got to make that curve taller and narrower. We have demonstrated with three factors, namely pH, reagent concentration, and incubation time, that we can put, put this process on target, but we've got to reduce the variation. Now, substrate type, where do we go for this? Well, we go back to our fishbone diagram or wherever we are to what are some of the other factors mm -hmm. that could impact standard deviation. And we've got to search those guys out. We've got to test those. We already have a hint. One of the hints, I don't know if you remember, was substrate type. Right, right. Now we can go into our vendor, work with our vendor on that substrate type, probably do a DOE at the vendor's facility to find out how we can improve that substrate even more than what it is doing now. We know, we know whatever is in that substrate type is causing variance reduction. Can we exacerbate those particular factors and get more information? That may, and this is very typical of DOE, one DOE might going to lead to another. Yeah. Hey, Mark, can we can we have just said um, it looks like substrate type two is better than substrate type one. Let's do a DOE with only substrate type two and these different factors and see if it reduces the standard deviation. And then if it does, then whoever's supplying substrate type one, they need to go solve their own problem. That's not our issue. We fixed our process. Second DOE, Mike, was done with substrate type 2 held constant at the better setting. Okay. So okay. we did not find any other factors that reduce variation. So we're still hurting for the factors that are reducing variation. We still have to search those guys out. And actually, they did, they did more screening designs uh, and found uh, variance shifting factors as well. But one of the, the things was... That substrate, substrate vendor, type 2, which we were getting small standard deviations, going back to them and saying, okay, what are the major ingredients of this substrate? What can we go and find out uh, as to what might uh, you know, change our standard deviation even further, make right. it even less? So they worked with that vendor, but they found some other factors as well that reduced the standard deviation even further. So, uh, you know, that they, so they not only had it centered on the process, but then they reduced the standard deviation by going to the vendor and helping them do, uh, analyze the factors that might affect their output of their process. Exactly. Right. So output, the output of their process is an input to these guys' process. Right. That's exactly. exactly. And that's where you get this cascading effect of the propagation of error, the propagation of variability, where the variation coming out of one process is input to the, uh, to the next process. And that's where going back earlier into the life cycle, that is, of the process, getting back to that vendor of substrate and finding out we got to make this guy better. We already know that there's something in your substrate that is making the variation low. Mm -hmm. Can we take advantage of that further? And they did that.